I promised to be here this week at, at number 12 for the purposes, um, for Kevin, for the purposes of discussing um, uh, this. His question is, all this talk on the old academic approach and how it differs from the impressionist approach has brought to mind a question, another question. Seeing as how their goals are very different from one another, do you think it's possible for aspects of both to be used together in a picture? Or would you say they're mutually exclusive? And I think that's really quite a uh, uh, sharp question. The, um, the um, interesting thing for me last week, I was looking, just this past week, I was looking to uh, uh, discuss Degas with my students uh, because I had, in the course of uh, digging around, I'm actually trying to formulate a, a book related to Degas' composition, his ideas about composition, and, uh, but with particular reference to color and that sort of thing. But in digging around, I, I, had to, I went through Gamble's shop talk again, and, um, and uh, one thing leading to another, I found myself really wanting to talk with students, my own students, about the, uh, the stuff he was doing in a picture. Because Paul Valery, his friend had said about him, Paul Valery is a poet, a Paris poet, a friend who you know, he would eat uh, lunch with and that sort of thing. And of course, Degas would uh, regularly talk him, um, uh, <laughs> give, give him a really hard time uh, for offering his opinions about every, everything and thinking he understood something when he didn't know how to paint, didn't understand painting from a practical point of view, which is still a pretty correct way to think about people talking about painting. Uh, but, uh, but what was interesting is I discovered, oh, I'm sorry, so Paul Valery said, he said, Degas was a, I think he might have said the word member of the cult of the integrity of the contour. And it was as if, and then he, then he says, it was as if he didn't see what was going on around him, which he must have. And uh, so what was going on around Degas at the time was, um, uh, well, you know, you had the Boudins and the Jonkines. These guys were older than Degas. They were the, early, the pre-impressionists from the point of view of Monet being like the, the naming moment in Impressionism. And they're painting uh, differently. They're not painting anymore from the outlines, from the contours, and closing contours. And, and at one point, Degas describes um, a drawing as what happens between the outlines, between the contours. So as if the whole problem of drawing is modeling. And uh, it's, hu it's, it's a huge piece of the problem of drawing, you know, a form. Uh, but uh, those other gentlemen in the Boston School uh, were working in a different way. And um, so instead of working with closed outlines, they were working with effects. And they were, and they were uh, playing effects off of each other and finding relationships between effects, even to create their drawing. It's hard to explain that in a, uh, in a uh, purely verbal uh, way without looking at pictures. And one of these days, uh, my, my, my uh, producer is suggesting that I actually show a picture and maybe that's a really good one to do, to show a couple pictures, maybe side by side, of uh, a picture done one way and a picture done the other. But if you take Ang to be the, 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 um, the atypical um, uh, outline-based guy, and it, and it goes right through the Renaissance. I mean, virtually everybody is outline-based. You know, there are hints of something else in people like uh, Tenoretto or, uh, oh, there was a, another Italian there, uh, and whose name I forgot, not as big, not as big a name. Uh, and all that's happening, even with Velasquez, the early Velasquez. But Velasquez changes, and it's interesting that the way Velasquez changes is related to this question, but both Millet and Degas say they can't understand. It's hard for them to grasp what, what Velasquez is doing. And they say it in different ways, but it's very clear that Velasquez is the new guy in the block. There's something going on here. And once you become purely visual, once it's a, the question is impressionism, in other words, painting the scene before you uh, from life, uh, uh, your methods change. They in inevitably change. And I say they change. Well, if you're painting out of your head, you, in, you, you're really stuck with the problem of having to draw a figure, you know, have a model pose for you, have another model pose, and get these figure drawings done, and then get them into the picture somehow. And then piecing, piecing, piecing together. But when you're painting from life, like one of those scenes, say, from Velasquez's um, Las Meninas or Las Alondras, it's clear that those pictures were set up. Now, it's true that some parts of them were 
it wasn't impossible. It wasn't likely that he had every person in that in uh, each of those pictures each time he painted. But and that can be managed. But typically, you know, uh, when you're talking impressionism, you're talking about there's the scenario. That's the whole thing right there already. And your job is to draw forth the beauty. Uh, and um, yes, and so what happens is we see a whole different way of working. What I found really interesting and uh, was that Degas did both. And in answer to your question, Kevin, <laughs> you can do both. But if you look at Degas where he does both, he looks like he's in conflict with himself. I mean, that's where you got to consider what he's doing. <laughs> so, so when he, but, but, but not necessarily and not always. And, and there's a way in which it sort of can work. And I do mean drawing from the outline and filling in and then other places actually drawing in visual order. But it's an odd thing to do. I mean, when I say that, there's a certain uh, lack of unity in the method. So that's what I'm looking for. When you ask that question, um, I wish I could see this on screen. Um, so do you think it's possible for both aspects to be united together in the same picture? I don't know of anybody else actually who even, I'd like to say who even tried. Um, but... Um, but I, but I would like people to look at the passages in Degas, some of his portraits, for example. There are certain areas of the background where he had a pile of papers or, or some books and something and something, and it was clear that he was setting that thing up from the look of nature on the spot. And his entire way of working completely switches to visual order of thinking. So much so that you'd say, oh, Boston School. And then you go to the, a lot of the later nudes and uh, some of the dance ones. It's clearly working from outlines. And then somewhere in there, he's working from outlines and he does this visual order stuff. But I want to remind you again that he's piecing it together because the painting itself is pieced together. So at that point, you know, I suppose it's any man's game. And, um, and I admire him for what he's doing. Um, possibly no, you know, no painter does more interesting things and, and falls apart more frequently and succeeds more frequently than this guy at the cutting edge, you know, trying to do something that hasn't been done before. So, uh, but my experience is that Impressionism has a best way. And, uh, and all I mean by Impressionism, again, is just when you're doing a portrait, when you're doing, a, you know, any scene setting before you where all the elements are there already, and your job is actually to, to, to set up the, the color relations and the, and the spot you know, the, 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 uh, the spotting, the arabesque, uh, and the effects and the form and all these things simultaneously, uh, you will approach it differently from doing a series of drawings of all those parts. There's a funny thing that goes on in Ang's, and you could say in some sense that he tries to combine it, but he sets people up and then he draws them, but it looks like he really then sets them up again without the model there, sets something else up, and he then eventually winds up making an imaginative painting out of a portrait. Um, I don't see that Velasquez, even early on, ever did that. His Velasquez portraits were all done from the outlines, which he eventually walked away from. But, but, um, uh, but he never does them as uh, you know, pieces from the imagination he then glues into a picture. I don't see very many people who do it, even in the outline world, when they're painting something like a portrait. Uh, it's possible in the Holbeins, um, which look like they were set up, some of the parts of them look wrong, and I'm guessing that those parts are the ones he didn't have setting up, and he had added them in later for some reason or other, and you know, without the scene. But Holbein's a harder one to, to fathom than... But I don't want to be definitive about it. I mean, you know, the world's your oyster. I find that... Um, the unity of the treatment is a big deal in painting. Uh, it's not an absolute, but it's the, one of those things that gives us, it's, it's a form of aesthetic unity, painterly unity. Uh, so that's a reason to do it. Um, and yet the painter's hand has its own unity, even if he's taking some, somewhat different approaches. Uh, so I, you know, I mean, in the same picture, uh, it's still his hand, it'll still have his color and his unities in other ways. But that's one that I do find a, a bit of a distraction, and I find it Degas is like the like the guy, and it is interesting. He sits there literally right at the crossroads. He sat there trying to become a um, a salon painter, you know, a painter of these history pictures, which is everybody believed was the be all and end all of art, you know, of painting, and uh, and of course that was not without a little influence from the state, and. Uh, 
but uh, then all of a sudden he's by hook and crook. I mean, he was a he was a he was a guy who got around a bit, and I say that he and he had friends, and he, he and he made connections, and he saw things happening around him. Paul Valerie didn't think he saw it; he saw it, and he actually did it. But he's kind of cool because he's right there at that crossroads. And the part I like best about Degas, and this takes us into a whole other question, and is is where where, where we find the his the um, the astonishing intellect that he brings to the abstractions of painting, to the pure music aspect of painting, which I think, I, I, I would argue that I don't think any painter's ever done it before. Uh, I think Gamal May and the Shop Talk have referred to him as the greatest intellect of that sort. Um, uh, he, he, didn't mean, he didn't mean there was an intellect in the sense of uh, being a, a scholar, erudite in other ways, but in the treatment of color relations, of form relations, and the play, the music involved in the play, uh, I wish I could show you that, you know, there's so, there's so many marvelous things that just deserve a book, and I'm going to get there. But um, let me leave it at that for this one, okay? I hope that's enough for you, Kevin. Um, by the way, I just wanted to, uh, to mention this. I, it's, it's, I'm not going to take a whole show to talk about it, but somebody, Jack, uh, Jack, who I hadn't uh, run into before on YouTube, said, thanks, uh, enjoying your lectures as always. I really like to hear that as always. I like that there are people who actually are, are, are in this, you know, I, I don't think of them as followers, but, but it's nice to know that people are getting like the bigger picture of what I'm saying. You hear one here and hear one there and dismiss me, but, but for somebody to listen, I really appreciate that, that you're actually listening week after week. You mentioned Amari Duvall's, the atelier, it's called Le Atelier d'Ang here. Uh, I, I mentioned is that Gamel had tr uh, translated that from French. Um, it is, uh, Amari Duvall was a student of Ang, and he's talking about the studio. And, uh, and he said, I wonder if you might have time to make this available as you did with Frank Benson's Advice to Artists, which I've enjoyed very much. So to Jack and to the rest of you out there, I will, I will do that. I'll make an effort to do that and get it out there where you can have it, okay? So stay tuned somewhere. I'll try to let you know where I put that. Uh, probably be on my, one of my websites, um, maybe the uh, Boston School Painting one. So uh, yes, I do. I do. I will do that. I'll probably even throw in a few illustrations. I don't know if Jack got the illustrated version that I sent out, but I think that's a lot more fun to have a few Angs and even a few Amari Duvall images uh, to go with it. Anyway, subscribe, uh, like, uh, share, etc. Thank you very much. See you next time. And don't forget to keep sending your questions. All right, good. So far, we're barely scraping them. We're we're there, you know. But we're uh, and I have enough for the next three shows. But I'm. Don't hesitate. Uh, follow up with me or any new idea. I mean, a lot of times people don't say something because uh, you know how it is in school. So they, they think they're going to think somebody's that they're dumb or something or other. There is there, everybody has to work through this whole thing from from scratch, and it's funny how many things you can know, say, at my age, and still not know something else. So don't don't think that way. You know, you've covered certain ground and maybe have missed other things that somebody else has seen. So yeah, ask questions. Love to have them.